My name is Chris Jansen. Welcome. This is the One Great Work Warriors. This is a crew of gentlemen. They're working together. Um, we have a mastermind style meeting, mastermind style meeting every week. We're working on learning the tech. We're learning, we're learning how to become the true media. We're learning how to talk about subjects of freedom, truth, and natural law. Our main subjects of interest. We're um, philosophers. We're um, people that are wondering. We're curious. We're learning. We're working on ourselves. We're doing our shadow work. And we're trying to help work towards a better world because we've all come to recognize there are some very serious problems in our world that are um, creating a situation of slavery. People are stealing from one another. There's just massive, um, terrible tragedy going on in the world, a lot of suffering. And um, every individual here in this meeting has come together because we care and we wanna make a difference. I'm very um, thankful today to have um, Stephanie Mo Davis and Leslie Powers with us. Welcome ladies, please. Um, I'll start with Stephanie. Um, introduce yourself and um, tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and what brought you here. Mm, thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I, I almost feel overwhelmed to be in this complete, authentic, vulnerable energy with you guys and just saying, hey, look, we're working on it. It's difficult. It's just such a breath of fresh air as a woman to hear that brutal honesty. So it's really a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I've been following Mark Passio's work and, and the science of natural law for close to eight years, um, off and on, but pretty regularly. And um, I'm here at this meeting because I was able to meet Rick and a couple of other guys that have uh, uh, shows on the One, One Great Network. I hooked up with Leslie not that long ago. And I'm very confident and pleased that this hidden nature that I was watching Mark from the background and not necessarily participating, now I've been uh, invited a seat at the table, so to speak, and I'm just really pleased to be here and to share my, my views and what I've learned from a feminine perspective. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, Leslie, you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Leslie Powers. I'm a clinical social worker. I'm licensed in the state of California. I've been working in this field for like 30 years, something crazy like that in a whole variety of settings. And I've always been um, a seeker of truth and trying to understand what true spirituality is. I was introduced to Mark Passio's work in 2018 and it's just um, really been life-changing for me, this whole, um, you know, natural law, but not only that, but all of the material that he covers in his whole podcast, you know, to understand what's going on in the world. So I'm committed right now. I'm dedicated to being um, one of the people who's sharing information and um, for the love of, you know, humanity and uh, freedom. Thank you, Leslie, for what you're doing and, and for joining us today for this discussion. Um, and for dissolving the divide here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, I have a website, Live Thrived Out Life. And then Derek and I um, have a podcast that's like, take, has a lot of momentum right now called Dissolving the Divide. We have a YouTube page and an Odyssey page. The same for my website. And so, yeah. Yeah, you guys it's are doing awesome. great work. And um, I just had the wonderful opportunity yesterday to meet with Derek and Leslie, and we did a discussion about money. That was today, so, Chris. That just yeah. feels like it. Well, it's been <laughs> two days in one day. That's what happened. Yeah. It's been like, uh, packed in for me recently. The weekend um, warrior, man. Hell yeah, Chris. Yeah, we'll talk about warrior, energy, right? Man. Weekend work warrior, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and you know, I, I feel so lucky to have met Brandon, Spencer, Jim Adams, Derek Bartoloselli, um, Jerry, and Rick. You know, these wonderful guys um, have been meeting with me every week and taking part in um this work that i'm trying to do and they're doing it you know in a lot of ways better and different than i am and i appreciate each of their efforts and um what they bring to the table and so we had a recent discussion we were talking about what does it take to be a man or what does it mean to be a man we asked the question in both ways and we had a good a great discussion and um we'll share that link along with this video um, of what we said, we just got together the guys and we talked about it. And then we got really curious, like, I wonder what a female would say, you know, we really wanted to hear the female perspective. And we were getting comments from females saying they wanted to be part of the conversation. And so we're like, yeah, we want to hear what you have to say. So um, for the next, um, however long we want to go, 
I'd like to open the table to Leslie and Stephanie. You guys can kind of back and forth. Um, any of you guys you want to jump in and it, with little comments and stuff. But for the first hour, we're going to kind of concentrate here on the, the female perspective on what we discussed. What does it take to be a man? What does it mean to be a man? Um, however you want to reflect on that. I'll go ahead and pass it to you, Stephanie, and then let, let it go from there. Great. Again, thank you. I feel so honored to be in the presence of all of you and including Leslie to be here as another representative of the feminine. I didn't structure anything before this meeting. I wanted to try to be as intuitive and honest and deeply vulnerable as possible to share what, what has been my experience. And to me, this is a, a big component of feminine energy is the intuitive, the creative, the very direct experience in the moment, that honesty, that vulnerability, and that ability to share with compassion and love and to tell the truth. So I, I wanna tell you when you ask this question, I wanna start back in the beginning. And when I was young, I watched Disney. I watched all sorts of movies that many girls did. And I had this very naive perception that the man was the prince or the king and the woman was the princess. And I had seen these men be strong, slaying dragons, uh, just holding that masculine energy. But for me as a young child, that's not what I was modeled as a young lady. So um, to, to just be honest with you, to give you a little history, my parents met very young. They were 18 when they had me. And if you could just imagine what sort of masculine or feminine wisdom would a person have at that age. Uh, so I grew up in this environment where um, my father embodied more of a passive energy or, uh, or an energy of what I would call as this kind of, he needed to integrate his masculine. And my mother was the opposite. And I found over the years that this is really common in a lot of households with a lot of men and women that the woman is more dominant based off of her unmet needs, not really healthy dominance based out of her fears. And the man is trying to do everything to navigate this chaos, so to speak. And he becomes very passive and compliant. And that's what I grew up with. And I didn't have the emotional literacy when I was young to understand the dynamic. I just knew that my father didn't really feel there for me. And my mother also felt very absent and controlling. And as I got older, I did what most of us do to seek out healing. And that's to continue to pursue relationships with those same patterns so I can try to develop an understanding of what the hell happened to me. But again, I didn't have the emotional literacy to know. I didn't, wasn't aware that I was dating the same men as my, man, as my, my father, that I had that same energy. And that really had been the bulk of my experience until I really had a profound ambush awakening spiritual experience in uh, about 2014. And I had already been watching a lot of Mark Passio's work at the time, but that wasn't what really initiated this shift. What initiated the shift within me was through a man who I fell in love with. And we started to play out these dynamics of healthy masculine, toxic masculine, wounded woman, healed woman. And it started flipping between us and it started taking on a life force of its own. And I came to realize very quickly that this necessarily wasn't toxic, but more of an opportunity for both of us to really clearly see where we were unbalanced and to do what it takes to start to work together and alchemize some of this wounding and to see how if we could make it through the fire to come out the other side. And it was very deeply complex and very heartbreaking for both of us. But what I learned was I didn't know the first thing about what it was like to be in a sacred feminine energy. And he didn't know the first thing about what it was to be in a more healed masculine energy. Where we had to start was where we were. And that was what was coming up through us of this is definitely what these energies are not. So that was my experience. I had to go through a very long journey, an experiential journey of understanding what healthy feminine energy is not, and what healthy masculine energy is not. So I think I would like to start out there before I talk about what it is. I'd like to tell you that I had to discover what it's not. And that may be my more honest uh, expression of this because I, I haven't really discovered ex exactly yet 
what that healthy masculine looks like, especially in today's times. Because as you said, Chris, we're living in a completely different dynamic where it's not easy at all to just choose to embody a healthy masculine or a healthy feminine energy. And there's a ton of work that has to be coupled with even beginning to comprehend and integrate and then choose to live it out in the world. So I wanna be really honest. I don't know exactly what healthy masculine energy is. As a woman, I know what it's not. And I, as I come into my own healed feminine energy and the commitment to continue on that process, I'm starting to see more clearly the qualities within a man that I really truly desire from my more healed version of my feminine energy. Does that make sense? And do you guys have any questions? Uh, yeah, real quick. It, well, more just, you know, as a man who's in touch with his inner Yoni, you know, just... <laughs> <laughs> for real though, but um, uh, yeah, what you're talking about is how this whole truth discovery of, you know, natural law and understanding what our rights are, you guys, probably mentioned this I wasn't in the first discussion of what you guys talked about but yeah Stephanie what you're talking about is trying to define things through the apophatic inquiry in a sense yeah. you know, like just like don't you know, sit them through everything what it isn't and that is finding that that alchemical gold that you're talking yeah. about too I, I love everything you said uh Thanks. yeah that's such a deep um, arduous uh process to go through with a uh, with another person and um Anyone who studied shadow work and uh, Carl Jung, Jung in psychology, he talks profoundly about this in that, you know, a lot of shadow work is going to arise in relationships, you know, with the mom or dad issues and the parental trauma and all those things that are going to resurface in future relationships because of that, you know, unhealed trauma and, you know, negative feedback loops and all that stuff. So, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Yes. I and really appreciate the honesty and the mm -hmm. humility. And um, I always like, I'm suspicious of people that act like they know it all, you know, yeah. Dude, when I first started listening to Pasu, I was a little suspicious. I'm like, oh, yeah, when somebody acts like they know it all, you know, some, that usually is a sign. But, you know, a lot of people do. Um, a lot of us have gained a lot of experience and knowledge, but but coming forward with that humility and honesty is, yeah, I really treasure that. Thanks, Stephanie. Mm. Yes. Stephanie, are you ready to share a few of the things you learned that would you would say are not the qualities of men, the healthy man? Yeah, I am. Um, before I proceed into that, Leslie, I want to say that that journey I, I took with this gentleman was eight years, and I can't romanticize it one bit. It almost killed me several times, and I'm not joking around. I'm talking like literally it almost killed me. And mm -hmm. But I understand, and my humility comes from that, is that when you're dealing with the sacred, you don't fuck around. Am I allowed to swear? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Curse all you want. Yeah, Curse all you want. Right yeah. <laughs> you can say anything you want on here. It's some powerful shit. You can't fuck around with that energy. So my humility, you know, I realize that if I get a little too high on my own supply, I better look out. So it's something that I do approach with deep reverence and love and humility because I've been knocked on my ass the moment I'm a little too righteous and I don't like it. So I try to stay quite humble. So from my perspective, so um, what I realized masculine energy is not. I think the biggest thing for me to make peace with was that it's not controlling. Mm. And I see this within my own ma inner masculine as a female as well, is that if I feel controlled, uh, by someone else or dominated over or somehow feel as though somebody is attempting to put me in a box, which is such a classic female wound. She feels trapped, boxed in, small, limited, unheard, unseen, undervalued, underappreciated. It's this metaphorical box and I'm very sensitive to it because it's taken me a long time to break myself out of that. So I can tell now that if I interact with a man because of the emotional literacy that I've developed, I can see if his energy is trying to weave a web of maybe manipulation or control or dominance because he, he wants to attempt to be that masculine. I have the discernment to more so feel as though if his resonance is coming from purity, like the protection and that, that overarching aspect of 
I got you, I'll take care of you is coming from his heart or it's coming from the unhealed aspect of the ego. I can, I can resonate that in my body. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Yep. Yes. Um, just one thing to kind of touch up on what you were saying, because you talked about the controlling aspect of this masculine energy that comes from, um, it's almost like your ego gets attached to the warrior archetype. So this warrior archetype can have this negative hell energy of wanting to control and wanting to dominate, but it can also in its balanced form have this energy of wanting to uh, protect. So it's, it's like it's like you were saying that a lot of men get stuck because their ego attaches to this warrior archetype, then therefore they don't do any work to, you know, to develop in this archetype. And then therefore that's where that controlling aspect comes from. You know, this kind of low conscious level, kind of animalistic, you know, uh, horde, very kind of predator like just stuck in the kind of sex drive and they want to dominate and tell other people what to do. So that's kind of almost a, a very underdeveloped and a non healthy way that our egos do attach to these archetypes because these archetypes exist in all of us. Of course, you have the warrior, you have the king, you have the magician, and you have the uh, lovers. And that's just, you know, symbolic of the four elements. So this warrior archetype is that fire hell energy. It is that drive. It is that willpower. But if used in its negative, you know, modalities, then that's when it becomes a problem. Mm. Yeah. To parlay on what you're saying, Brandon, thank you for saying that, is that I, I perceive it two subtly different ways is that I like a man to take action if I need to be kept safe. Meaning if something's attacking me and he's going to run out and he's going to protect me from the lion, I'm very appreciative of that. I'm appreciative when a man knows when to take action to protect me. What I don't need is overprotection. Yes. Because then I feel like there's a fear that he thinks he's going to lose me. And, and now energetically, it just, it, it kind of, ref, it, reflects off of me in a negative way because I can feel that insecurity coming from a sense to overprotect. So I'm not the type of woman who d is going to deny protection or action or a man being a little bit more dominant. I, I like that. I like those traditional roles. I love them, but I don't want it to be overprotection, over smothering if that makes sense. I, I hope this isn't too specific. You know, I don't want to try to give you guys a list of like, well, you got to do it this way, not this way. That's cool. Yeah. Just well, real quick, you get you, you brought up something interesting about this toxic masculine way of controlling and it brought up an interesting example and I'm just going to let, let you guys, you know, run with it if you want. But um, Anakin Skywalker, you know, and like what you said, uh, fear, that's the key word, a fear based to, you know, a lot of things that, you know, are, you know, lead to this, you know, negative side of either mas masculine, feminine energies, whatever, actions, behaviors, all that shit, man. But uh, yeah, Anakin Skywalker, he was so obsessed with, you know, oh, Padme, you know, I got to protect you and, blah, blah, you know, all that stuff. And, and what did he do? He turned to the dark side because, you know, so much fear it consumed him, right? So anyone have to say, does that make sense and tie into oh, yeah. what you're talking about? I wanted to jump off of the archetype um, example, Brandon. And that I think that part of um, the wisdom is knowing, is having an ability to fluidly move among the arch archetypes of masculinity um, and to kind of know when to embody a particular archetype. And so how does one know that? Well, it involves a deep listening and a deep observation and a willingness to um, respond to the need, let's say, of the feminine or the need of the situation, right? Um, that there's a certain service, a, a spirit of being in service to, to life, to the feminine, to a goal, right? Um, so I'll say, that's all I want to say on that, but. It... I think that's the problem too, Leslie, is that a lot of guys don't know the difference between the two roles because when they women say they want a protector they want this guy like like stephanie was saying to go out and if business needs to be taken care of take care of it but then to know when to reel it back when it's they're not in that in that mode and i've talked to a lot of guys in there and they kind of they can't 
they have a lot of trouble differentiating differentiating between the two and pulling back and they kind of get stuck in that protective mode and i think back because I'm, I'm glad that stephanie kind of brought up when she was growing up with her parents because i'm thinking of my parents and my dad was very very much the the very dominant ruled with an iron fist kind of and not really in touch with this care act he had a form of care in his own way but it wasn't what it wasn't what people needed i guess in the family like he he kind of had his own way but he was very much stuck in that protective mode and like i said ruled with an iron fist kind of and i just that was something that just didn't work good when we were growing up it was kind of like i just saw and and, and at times it made me scared of him because i was just like he was so powerful all the time and then i look at my mom who she seemed to have it all figured out she could be really tough when she had to be but then she could pull it right back and be that really loving woman and and mother and no and she she could flip between the two perfectly but my dad he was that full i guess because he always said it was the way he was raised that that was just that aggressive male energy and now that he's up in age and he's like in his 70s he's starting to finally it took that long for my dad to kind of learn about care and even talk about it and open up with his feelings it's interesting mm. thanks rick for saying that I i'd like to go back for one moment and talk about this aspect of control is that there's a there's two sides to this coin too is that the control of the feminine but also and differently is when i have my feminine i want my environment to be in control so it, it's kind of like an inward thing and also an outer external environmental thing. So maybe, you know, you're with a guy who wants to come off reputationally, like he's got everything together. And then behind closed doors, he's maybe not so friendly to his wife. So again, it's like the control can be over the woman or like environmentally. I want to control my environment and I act this way reputationally outwardly, but then I'm not always aligned in my personal relationships if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Some of the fluidity is in sometimes shifting polarity with the female that they're with and allowing that, right? A man who's secure in his masculinity will really be okay to step back and allow a woman to step up in her masculine, mm -hmm. you know, and to be um, really secure in himself. You, you know, know what? kind of gets me thinking about I've seen a lot of couples where there um, there's jealousy issues and you know the uh it's, it tends to be more the guy you know like who are you talking to over there you know I saw you looking at that guy you know like anytime a guy comes out and starts trying to get in that I think that's what you were that's what I was thinking about Stephanie when you were talking about that subtlety of someone putting too much control or pressure you like the male kind of um more not I don't want to use the I'm thinking of the right term, not aggressive, not um, dominating, but um, assertive. assertive, right? Assertive, okay, you like yeah. the assertiveness, but on the other hand, when that assertiveness takes that manipulative edge to it, like, why were you talking to her? That actually shows weakness, right? It doesn't show self-assuredness if you're afraid that the other person doesn't really, you know, um, trust you or, or love you or that they might be interested in someone else. And so as soon as somebody starts pushing in that way, like they're trying to control your actions or movements. Like you shouldn't have gone and talked to that person or you shouldn't have winked at that person or whatever. And if someone does that, that's obviously bleeding from, you know, their own self-control into trying to control you. You know, I don't know if that's right, but that's kind of what I, what came into my mind when you were talking, Stephanie, but I'll hand it back to you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not here to judge any relationship, but what I've discovered is that some men or women like that. It, it feeds them like if the guy is jealous or it feeds them if and to me i, I don't think that's um healthy i, I think i don't think it's healthy i don't want to judge but i don't think it's healthy i think it's filling a gap filling some sort of wound energy and, and again you can see couples who live this way and their yeah. wounds kind of fit perfectly into one another and it they might be able to live somewhat happily that way but in my life um i've come into this process as all of us have here and um, I know that that's not the way that I, I choose to be. So, uh, Leslie, to your point, too, about the masculine and feminine flipping and doing this beautiful dance, 
I totally agree, but I think it, it's a real process to be able to start to do that. But one thing that I've discovered is that I think that we live in a time, and please tell me if I'm inaccurate in my hypothesis, but I think that we have lived in a time with relationship and what we told ourselves was that relationships take work. Things are going to, you know, it's, it, it's always going to be kind of up and down and you're going to, it's, it's all about how much you can get through together. Right. And in an aspect, I, I don't want to kind of poo poo that aspect of working together, but I think that some of us have gotten too comfortable and accepting that is the norm when maybe actually you're just not with the right partner. You're not really equally yoked with your right partner. And I think you can get stuck thinking, well, marriage is hard and this is what we're supposed to do and we have to keep working on it. I think there is a difference and there's a subtle knowing that comes only when you can start to know thyself to really be able to discern with your partner and say, this is complicated, but we can really dance together well and it, and it is making us grow. Or this is my partner and we're going through a lot together, but actually you're, you're actually kind of devolving in the relationship. You're not necessarily evolving. It's not pulling you up and out. It's just pulling you up and out enough to continue to stay stagnant, if that makes sense. Do you guys have anything to say about that? spot on <laughs> at least <laughs> yeah i know i, I know so people true. like that i know people like that stephanie that their relationship is it's a struggle and and they've said that i've heard them say that like you know oh, relationships are tough you know there's always tough tough times and i don't know i've been married 25 years and i and i'm being serious it's not that tough i i mean i'm not trying to brag i'm, I'm just being honest I'm it wasn't it's not like there's moments where it's tough everybody has tough points in their relationship and little things you got to get over but it was I've never looked at it as work I've never thought like I had this is something we have to work on it just it works I don't know how to put <laughs> it can't, I don't know how to put it but it just works it's not work if you know what I mean it's if I, yeah if I could just clarify I hear what you're saying Rick and that's freaking awesome I think that's amazing um I think they're both work but one is with the recognition that we're pushing each, each other to grow and pop bubbles and really evolve. And one is it's work just to stay stagnant, right. just to stay at a neutral. And some people do that. But I'm in the, the hope and desire that this kind of he, more healed feminine masculine can come together in this relationship based off of equals in a union where they challenge each other lovingly to grow. They yeah. push to evolve, not, yeah. not yeah. fight to stay from not divorcing. <laughs> staying so in that comfort yeah. zone. Yeah. yeah, stay in that yeah. comfort zone to where there is no growth, there is no development, there is no, you know, working together and growing becoming a better holistic being so you can become a better holistic you know couple and working as one yeah a lot of people will rather stay in that comfort zone and you know stay in that complacency because it's just more easier to do because you know that's just one of the you know the things of being a, a, a human being is you know we like our comfort and and change is hard sometimes is it's the diving into the unknown, you know, trying to find a whole new partner, you know, you're having to create new routines, new rituals and all that stuff, you know, so a lot of people will just choose to stay in that complacency and comfort zone, which in actuality, like Stephanie said, in the long term is doing more harm then it is good because there is no growth. It's just a form of stagnation because if there is no growth, then is there really true love that is there, you know? Yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll share an example, maybe, from my own life. I, I was um, years ago with a, a guy who I loved so much and really could see um, my having a lifetime with him, respected him. Um, he was in a, in a way, I, mean, I don't know if this is good or bad or what, but in a way, he was on a little bit of a pedestal in my heart um, because of his character and his integrity. And uh, our relationship was very smooth. However, I um, was very determined that I wanted to be a mother. I wanted to have a baby. And he was 14 years older than me. And he wasn't sure if he wanted a baby. He spent 
I mean, this was something I valued so much that he did is he spent probably two years soul searching to really decide whether having a baby was, was the right thing for him or not. And he wasn't haphazard, you know, how many people just, you know, get pregnant, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. He was very thoughtful and he really cared not only about my desire to be a mother, but also about his own, um, his own life and himself and his being in integrity with his own mission in the world. And so he, he would talk to other women and he would ask them about their experience of being a mother and why it was important. And he, he really put work into this. And then finally he, you know, I was sort of maybe pressing it a little like, so, mm -hmm. you know, I can't really be here. I can't keep being here unless this is something that you want. And he, he had come to the conclusion that no, he did not want to um, bring a child into the world. And he, told me this in the most uh, beautiful, loving way that was one of holding me and my emotions around this and, you know, reassuring me that if he did want a child, I would be the one he'd love to have a child with, but he didn't want to hold me back from my fulfillment as a human being. And that if that was something that I wanted and needed, that he would would release me, you know, and let go for me to be able to do that. And it felt like um, that came from love and it was a very heartbreaking experience. And yet it was also a beautiful experience and it only put him high, even higher on this state of respect, the way I respected him and appreciated him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a beautiful story, Leslie. And I think yep. most people don't have that, um, depth of character to be able to make a decision in terms of like what's best for all of us mm -hmm. and sacrifice what what I might want for what's best for both of us or what's best for you in the long term and um you're lucky to have met that that gentleman and and he um you know what I really love though what what I wanted to come back to um what Stephanie the way she started this whole thing off was by expressing like, you know, growing up with the Disney programming, right? The princess programming and, and how, what, what's occurred to me is that by the time we're in our early twenties, we've all been severely traumatized. 98.9% um, .9 of the population went through school indoctrination, religious indoctrination, various government indoctrination, um, propaganda on, on all the um, television and screens and et cetera, et cetera. Um, toxins in the environment. So by the time we get ready to start um, a relationship, we're already beat up and ragged and war torn. And, and what I hear coming from what you're saying, Stephanie, is that most people are starting off a relationship <clears throat> with traumas. And they're yeah. all trying to start nobody Absolutely. knows what's the right way to handle this. And so it's really rare to find two people that have already worked through their trauma from their early part of their life and now are ready to work together on having this relationship thing, which is like a whole nother thing. Like you have to first deal with all this crap, mm -hmm. you know, that built up over the first 20, 25 years of your life or whatever, deal with that. Then you're ready to start helping somebody else with their problems. And most mm -hmm. of us, a lot of people never even get to that realization point in the first place. So I mean, I learned so much about trauma from Leslie, and I'm still um, working through some of my own personal trauma, but um, I'm well on that path. And I don't, there's no doubts of whether I'm willing to work on my trauma. And so it's easy, easier to deal with problems because I can say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's something I'm working on. And, yeah. and so I can understand that, you know, I, but um, I pass it off to you, Leslie. I think you're bringing up a good point that like being a man or being a woman isn't just something you jump out of the box you know, becoming, it's a process of becoming mm -hmm. you know, through and, our life experiences. Yeah. And I think, unfortunately, up to this point, most of us have been, I mean, I don't want to blame just Disney movies. It's, it's literally, it's in the air. It's so common growing up that this is the way a man should be. And this is the way a woman should be. It's not necessarily one thing I can pinpoint. It's so infiltrated into everything. It was like an assumption almost that that's how it should be. And then I agree with you. Um, Chris, you were talking about this idea of relationship and the trauma bonding is, you know, that theory of, you know, the honeymoon phase when you get with somebody or you get married with somebody and then like you have your honeymoon phase and then everything's downhill from there. <laughs> how I perceive it is actually 
you fall in love, a lot of the chemicals are triggered based off of that perfect trauma bond link almost, mm-hmm. right? It's like these, this person has the exact same triggers that are going to link up with your triggers. And there's that dopamine and oxytocin and chemicals that arise when you fall in love. It's like a big drug rush. And then the, when the honeymoon phase ends, to me, it almost feels what that actually means is now it's time to reverse engineer our trauma to see if we can get through it. And then I think that's why like the seven year marriage thing, like you see, if you're going to last after seven years, it's because you're actually reverse engineering your traumas through your relationship. It's like, you're going back in time, but we're not really consciously aware that I think that that's happening. And then when things come up, how we address them or how we create that life, you know, Brandon, you were saying the fear of change. I want to read you this, this meme that I saw, uh, man, it's really hit me because I, I know so many people like this. And I was on this trajectory at one point in my life too. It's as many people are actually afraid to heal because their entire identity is centered around the trauma they've experienced. They have no idea who they are outside of their trauma and that unknown can be terrifying. So it's like when you, you, you have this idea, this is my man, this is my, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, my family, our kids, our houses, our cars, our this or that. And then you start adding and accumulating more things and creating this whole life. And then it's like, I, I, I can't heal because if I do, it's going to be like a ball of yarn that just unravels my entire identity and life as I know it. And I don't know if I can actually survive that. And that's why I think some people talk about spiritually awakening. And they say that people who are over 55 or over a particular age, that it becomes more complex because everything is so much more concretized. Your entire life is actually surrounding a false identity. But the, yeah. the, the difficulty in that is that if you're called to awaken, if this, you know, sacred feminine masculine starts to come into your life and you, you smell it, you taste it, you touch it for a moment, life can become very, very depressing and dark when you see that that potential is there and you're, you're not quite strong yeah. enough to actually heed the call. And I think this is why people have heart attacks. So people have stuff like this. It's like, you're being called to something and are you strong enough to take the journey? And I have a lot of compassion for people who are in their sixties and have their entire life set up and they find something that's going to just unravel their identity. I have compassion. Um, and all I can do is speak for myself, but that call came for me when I was 40. And, um, I mean, where my entire identity collapsed, a tower moment, Everything went to shit in a handbag, and I willfully knew that it was happening, uh, but I, I, I leaned into the unknown, and it caused so much chaos within my family life, my business. I went through a divorce. I mean, my whole, all my business members knew what was going on. I was going into kidney failure for the second time. I literally was like, I'm going to end up on a corner alone getting dialysis treatments and like die because everybody was against this call. They literally thought that I had lost my mind. And I was like, I I, I couldn't have seen more clearly in that moment, but it was like, I was just following each little breadcrumb. I I just didn't know how it was all going to pan out, but my heart was so called. My spirit was so called to transform and to do this that I had to have faith and I had to trust what I couldn't see yet. This is my Stevie Nicks moment, right? Like I'm following that, which I couldn't see because the call was so strong in my heart, but it threatened not only my identity, but everyone around me who knew me, they were like, no, you doing this is going to make me change. And if yeah. everybody wanted to keep me in that box and I, I just... I kept pushing against that, that matrix and just kept trying to pop that bubble. And years down the road, I lost quite a few people, but the ones who were meant to be in my life returned and they returned with a sense of reverence for me. And they were like, holy shit, I, I wish I could do what you did. And I had so many people come to me individually and say, I'm really stuck in this marriage or I can't do this or I can't do this. Like, I just want to tell you that what you did and, and I, I, I didn't even really know what to tell them because I didn't feel like I had a choice. I felt like if I didn't choose the journey, I would die. And if I did choose the journey, I would die, but I would be reborn. 
And that's, that's the path that I took. And mm -hmm. like I said, it almost killed me. And I literally could see how people die doing this. But what's yeah. worse, die, dying not taking the step and not taking the journey and not taking the challenge to become your true self, you're going to die either way, is what I'm trying to say. Yep. So do you want to die with dignity and just fucking go for it? Or do you want to die knowing that, like, I'm too fucking afraid? You're right? the living dead, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yep. Derek, you got that uh you got that tower card ready? <laughs> yeah, usually you have your tarot cards, but uh Yeah, sorry man, I wish Yeah, no. Nah, it was <laughs> it was so many ready. Yeah. <laughs> you brought up so many great points there. Um and a lot of people fear jumping into the unknown because what that does is is the fear of change is is that creates that fight of flight or freeze you know like in a sense because you do have to shatter your beliefs you have to shatter your world views you know you may have to shatter the way you think feel hell about a certain you know individual so that's what people fear you know, have the most because you know, I've always, you know, thought that diving into the unknown, the unknown is the feminine. The unknown is where that change is. That's where the curiosity is. That's where that creativity is. But once you dive into it, you got to have that fluidity that Leslie talked about to be able to straighten yourself out and rebound and to be able to pull yourself back out to center and focus to walk your own path, to be your own, you know, uh, to be your own self to do your own work, to stay and have that focus so you can, you know, see your vision or see, you know, hell, your dreams or see yourself in a better version so you can aspire to that. So you do need that fluidity, you know, to be able to, uh, to be able to bounce back because you should always be jumping into hell unknown because chaos in and of itself isn't necessarily bad. Sometimes you may need that chaos to kind of shake things up. You know, sometimes that chaos can be that spark. Sometimes it can create that drive. So we need that from time to time to kind of reawaken or rekindle that lost fire or maybe that lost desire for truth, you know, to better ourselves, to want to help elevate our consciousness to, to hell evolve. Sometimes we have to be kind of shooken up you know we kind of need that bolt of energy that full heart energy sometimes to kind of refocus so yeah you need that fluidity um yeah and being able to rebound sometimes is 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 that is that that masculine male you know energy hell that we need from time to time can i ask you gentlemen a question all of you this is re weighs very heavy on my heart because I, I listen i love mark as much as everybody here loves mark but Mark said something to me once that crushed me, crushed my heart. And I don't think he was aware, but it crushed the tenderness within my heart. And Brandon, listen, when I had that call and my tower moment happened and I, I felt that unknown, that darkness, that womb space, the fucking abyss, I had the darkest fucking night of my life. I literally thought I would I was dead. I I had left, I had that tower, left my husband, left my job, left my family, left uh, kidney disease, da 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 to everything. I couldn't believe I survived, but then I ended up sleeping in a spare room of a friend's house. I lost my house, I lost my job, I lost everything. And I'm in a spare room of my friend's house in kidney failure. Okay. Broke everything. Was, and I laid there and I thought, what the fuck did I just do? It was the first time that I questioned that calling. I didn't have any energy or time to question that call prior because I was too busy in the chaos. Fucking shit up. I'm like tearing this down. Tower here, tower here, tower here. I was running on adrenaline, but when I stopped and I got in that bed of my friend in my friend's spare room, I had a moment, my mind came in, my this thing came in, and it was like, what the fuck did you do? <laughs> and I just was like, I felt it confronting me. And I was like, I followed you. And it wasn't my heart talking, it was my mind. It was like, no, you fucked up. Look at what you just did. You lost everything. Are you an idiot? What is wrong with you? I stopped following this 
call, the faith in my heart, I, I, my mind came in. And that night, I literally, I felt the abyss. It was the dark night of the soul for me. I can't even explain. It was like my soul went black and I never experienced anything like it. And I said goodbye to myself. I said goodbye to my family and my heart because I was 100% certain that I was dying that night. I, it's like, it wasn't dark on the outside. I was dark in here. It was black inside of me. I never experienced anything like it. Don't you know, I couldn't believe it when I fucking opened my eyes. I saw the sun coming in, shining in. And I'm in this shitty little spare room. I lost everything. And I opened my eyes. Sun. And I was like, am I in heaven? Like that was my first thought. Because I, I thought for sure I was still dead. And then um, I was orienting myself, orienting myself. I'm like, okay, still got a body. Okay. Like, I, I, I fucking made it. I made it. I was, it was my new life. It's literally like the metaphor of like being reborn. I was like, oh, this isn't some Christian shit where you take away for I'm like, I just, I was reborn. That night I died. And now, now this is my real life. And I was 40 years old. I woke up to my real life. And then it was like, clean slate. I was like, now you're going to do this right without the conditioning. And guess what? It's still going to be hard. You're still going to have to work. You just started. But it was such an incredible moment. And it's almost like I see my life. It's that Confucius quote. It's like, what does it say? A man has um, a man it has two lives, but he, he like it's. Do you guys know that quote? It's like a man has two lives, and then he wakes up to realize that he only has one, like something like that. And that's exactly how it was for me. I had this other life, and then when I woke up to my true self, I was I'm completely different. I look the same, but I'm completely different. Everyone can feel that within me, and I'm just so blessed that I had that opportunity to take that call, but. Dude, the darkness, the abyss, the the vastness of like being in a black hole in your soul. Like, look at me, look at, I look like a sweet young lady, right? Like, could you imagine that, you know, and I, I've been a pretty good woman as much as I've tried to be. Shit must have been real dark in my past life. I must have done something because my soul was dark. It was hard. It was hard, but I'm still telling you, and I would encourage anybody you are strong enough. Still do it. Still do it. Still do it. Wow, Stephanie. Yeah, real quick, just to rewind it to the beginning, because you, you know, made the introduction to like, wow, such a, <laughs> yeah, like, that's such a profound uh, experience you've had. And yeah, that that is like a frequency shift of like a whole life changing event. Like, wow, surviving that you you're just, yeah, like, <laughs> must have been dumbfounded for days to say the least, like, wow, uh, brave soul. But uh, you mentioned something leading up to that, you know, uh, in regards to like Mark Passio and. Yeah, I didn't tell I you. Yeah. So yeah, so basically. Did he my, talk to you personally or something? Or? Yeah, we were. I think I was on a call or I was in a group. I forget exactly what it was, but I'm trying to think. It might have been. Oh, you know what I think it was, guys. I took How to Become the True Media. And I think we did some talking after that. I think it was one of those calls. And um, you know what I said? <laughs> I said something about my journey requiring me to have faith and he immediately was like oh no I don't believe in faith and I was like like as a woman in the entire journey I, like I was literally following the unknown into the dark in my feminine like my feminine energy was going into the black hole the abyss and if I wouldn't have had faith in myself or faith in the process unfolding I'd be dead so to hear him say that when he was like, oh, I don't believe in faith. I was like, oh. like, I literally got beclamped. I was like, oh. <laughs> and then I thought to myself, can he not see her? Can he not see the experiential process of the journey? Like this sacred, like Mark knows care. Don't get me wrong. Dude knows care. But, but as a woman, I was like, my entire life has been based on faith in my process and trusting the unknown 
And to hear such a beautiful divine man say that, I felt very unseen as a, as a woman. And I felt like, in my mind, I was like, oh, I do, did I do something wrong? Like, what, what do you mean? Like, and then I had to just kind of let it go because I do have a reverence and respect for Mark, you know? And I had to just let it go and say, that's his belief and that's his journey. But Stephanie, you know, you're alive because of your faith, and that's okay. Yeah, we talked about this, this, Chris. One. We talked about this. Faith. Yeah, I want to field this one. This yep. is one of my favorite topics and one of my favorite words to discuss <laughs> because um, I think it's praise the like, Lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, um, faith. Like the I I created my podcast kind of around the book, um, the end of all evil by Jeremy Locke. Mm -hmm. And he has this really good description in the book about faith. Mm -hmm. And he talks about like a baby when it first learns to walk. Mm -hmm. And I think really the, the trouble with the word faith is it's completely um, in the world of religion. Hijacked. And, and it's, yeah. it's external. It's almost like religion, right? It's, it's evil when you externalize it. It was. When I faith try to faith someone else, it doesn't work. But when you have faith inside of yourself, for your own self that's a whole different thing and i don't think that's yeah. what mark was talking about because yeah. i think he would just use a different term and 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 i think that's it's just a problem of grammar yeah. not yeah. to say i agree with him on 100 percent everything but i would suspect that's really the difference there is that inner faith is a super positive thing it's like i can take this step i've described it as me like i like to jump across rocks yeah. and when i'm at a river i know when i can jump to that rock i have faith in my ability to mm -hmm. jump to that rock but I also know when it's a little bit beyond, I don't yeah. quite have that faith because I have experience of what I've jumped before. And I, and that's, doesn't feel right. Have and faith in the rock, man. Feeling. You do it by <laughs> feeling. You don't want to fall in the water. And sometimes you do. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. your faith is just a little, and that's how we grow as humans and in our inner faith. So I, I think it's yeah. just internalized versus externalized yeah. Yeah. how we use that word and whether yeah. it's positive or negative. Yeah. So Mark, if you're listening, you motherfucker. No, just kidding. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it, it wasn't religious. It was faith in myself to if I lived or died, I was going to just keep going. It was that deep sense of like, I'm going for it. It, it felt to me like the feminine version of bravery and courage. It was like, I'm yeah. trusting the unknown. I'm going yeah. for it. If I live or die, I have faith in whatever happens because I'm strong. It was, That's what it was. That's what I meant. So yeah. thank you for my, explaining that. Yeah. I have my own version of, of that, of embodying that faith. And it was in leaving, you know, my husband who I had three children with. And I spent literally like nine months preparing for that day that I was going to tell him that our marriage was going to end. And I woke up every morning at 5 a.m. and I did all this spiritual work on myself and meditation. And, you know, I did the, the book um, Entering the Castle by Carolyn Mace, which is a massive book. I, in no way did I go through every question in there, but it was a real internal exploration. And, and, I, and then made the followed through you know, I built up this decision and I followed through on it. And it, the day before that um, my decision was made that this is the day I'm telling him, he comes home and he says he was fired from his job. Ooh. And I was like, oh my God, I am now either going to be the biggest bitch. Talk about throwing a wrench in the right? Yeah, no right? doubt. Right? Wow. Biggest wow. fucking bitch. <laughs> yeah. To be a horrible person and tell this guy that, you know, the day after he loses his job that he's losing his wife and kids too. Oh. Like, and mm -hmm. yet I had to, mm -hmm. I could not postpone this another day. Mm -hmm. And I knew that if I waited, it wasn't going to make anything really better. And so I had to take this leap of faith that I was on the right path and that the work that I was doing mm -hmm. was legit. And it was a true to uh, my deepest understanding of what was right, you know, and again, the feeling of if I don't leave, my soul will die. Mm -hmm. My soul will die. Mm -hmm. It was dying. And that my soul had value, <laughs> you know, and it had, I had a yeah. life to live that needed to be, they couldn't do it in that context. So, you know, I proceeded forward. And I would say that is a leap of faith, you know. Um, that, so. um, Leslie, I want you to continue, but I just wanted to pop in and say that quote, that Stephanie was talking about, boy, what the story you told is, is just exactly, 
uh, the quote Confucius is, we have two lives and the second begins when we realize we only have one. Um, Go ahead, Liz. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I would like to jump in on some of my thoughts about um, what is a man, if it's good time for that. Perfect. Yeah, sure. Um, when I was listening, when you guys did your pod your podcast, you know, and Chris was was streaming it, and I was at a house of a friend, and she was really excited about this conversation, you know, this topic of what is a man, and and I want to share first what she, what she said because it it moved me and kind of my thought process, and she said, you know, men are honorable, good men do things that are honorable. And they need to be honored. So she she was pointing out that men have a certain role to live with honor, to do honorable actions. And yet they don't do that in isolation, that they do it in the context of being witnessed and supported and seen and honored. And I really like that. And it made me think about my father. Um, and I realized that my dad, I think, was a pretty good man. And I want to share a little bit about him. And I want to share because I also realized that I don't think I've really honored him, you know, out loud. And I want to. Um, and I'll probably cry. So I'll say my some things that I really appreciated about my my father. One is my father was kind of the black sheep in his family. His father was a cop. And there were three boys that survived. And they had one little girl that died when she was a toddler. But my dad was kind of the, the oddball out. He was, he was the musician and the artist in a family where the mask, his father expected, you know, the boys to be football players and hunters. And my father didn't have an interest in that. And he had a lot of courage, I think, in following his true calling and his passion from his teenage years. And in a sense, going against the approval of his own father. So I think that one is standing firm in your own true nature and your authenticity, right? And having that courage to pursue those dreams no matter what. And I see that my father did. He followed his pursuit, his, his passion for music till, till he couldn't physically do it anymore. You know, he was in his late seventies, you know, refurbishing pipe organs and playing pipe organs. And he, you know, I, as a child was, enthralled with his musicianship and when he would play the organ I followed him and I it brought out my desire to dance you know and and I loved anytime I hear like you know his warm-up on the keyboard I would be like there waiting and ready and and I think that that is um you know anyway I think that 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 his passion and being true to his passion in his life has an energy that is attractive, right? That magnetizes as well. And, and then my father, who I would say he followed traditional roles to a degree, but he didn't at the same time. You know, my mom worked, he respected my mom, he respected my mom's you know, uh, pursuit of her own career and encouraged and allowed her to develop herself. And I felt as a child that, you know, my father respected and trusted me. So as a teenage girl, he wasn't overly controlling. He wasn't, you know, freaking out. He, you know, I walked away feeling like my parents, they must, they must trust me. They must trust my ju judgment. And my father was actually the more nurturing of my parents. And he was the one who, when I was scared of Miss Rex Road, in second grade because I heard her yelling in the hall and I didn't want to go to her class and I was crying the night before the first day of school. He was the one that sat by me in my bed and he was present with my emotions. And he, he um, just said what 
the perfect things, you know, it was like he told me that he knew Miss Rex Road and she was really a, a, a sweet lady and she turned out to be, right? And he gave me a hug and he was these very key moments where um, he was present for me emotionally were really powerful. So I would say that the strength of him his, in, as being a man was also being emotionally present when he, you know, at these times with me as, as his child. And I think that the, being a man is, is a role in a context of relationships and that, um, that there's a great power, you know, and a strength in a man to be present with the emotions of, of other people and the emotions of the feminine. And he was um, also, you know, I remember him having a, a great love for his own mother. And my dad showed up, he showed up to help people, you know, and my grandmother was in the hot, in the nursing home, he was very consistent to visit her, you know, he, my dad was a man of, he followed through on his commitments. Mm. And he, he cared about his commitments. And I, there was never a moment that I would ever have doubted that about him. That he, I never would have doubted, even if my mom and dad had split, which they never did. They grew old, you know, together. He, um, I knew that even if they had, like, I would never have to doubt or question that he would be there for me in his, as a father. Mm. Um, and I would say that, you know, he, um, the, where he, where, where I miss him now, this was a thing I loved and adored my father but he worked too much in his dedication to supporting us and making money to pay the bills, which he was always stressed out about. He was gone. And that's one of the biggest holes in my heart mm -hmm. was that, you know, he wasn't physically present enough. So I do think that that being a man or a woman, you know, but but in the context of a man, you know, in the traditional role out there, the breadwinner, oftentimes what's missing is his presence. And, um, and so being present is so important. Um, I wanted to share a little bit more about some thoughts that I had about like, what is, what does it mean to be honorable? You know, I think maybe we could talk about that a little bit. What are honorable acts? And what does it mean to have a code of honor? And I I wanted to say that, you know, that there are qualities that I think embody, that a man can embody that are very uh, respect worthy. And those are courage and integrity, honesty and conviction, to be the steady, the steady line, you know, to have a goal, a purpose that, you know, one attaches to that is, um, you know, unswerving, that a man is unswerving in that direction, I think is important that a man follow through on responsibilities and sees them through to a natural end and, and also is taking responsibility for the consequences of their actions. So a lot of times, you know, we have, for example, in the world, you know, many children being born without being planned and many, many men uh, are, are absent in their role as fathers. And that's, that's an issue. And I think that when we think about, okay, as a kid, I was really, for some reason, it was really important to me that somehow I had to prove that, that girls could be just as good as boys and that I could be anything I wanted like a boy could. And there was some kind of a doubt, you know, that got put in my head, like from the world that said, I wasn't, I couldn't, or I wasn't as important. And I remember thinking, you know, um, that, that, would I want to be a man? Would I want to be a boy? And I was like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> because and one of the things was, I was like, I can kind of as a girl, I can sort of choose how I want to present myself in a way I can dress however I want, I could dress like a tomboy, I can, you know, and there was like this flexibility. And I was seeing at the time that I grew up, 
that, that the boys were, were kind of pigeonholed into what it means to be a boy. And, and that it was like, you don't cry and you don't wear pink. And you, you know, there was like this societal pressure to somehow tell a boy what it means to be a boy and to be a man. And I, and I felt like that was much more rigid for boys than it was for girls. And I think that a lot of men have, didn't get to experience a more, the freeness of figuring out who they are outside of that um, stereotypical little pigeonhole that they're being put in. But I, um, I think that, that there's, when we think about the truth and we think about the context of having a purpose, to me, there's, there's, it's about not just being self-serving in one's goals, but to have um, a, a care about, about a, a mission, a cause, whether that's a family and raising a child and being there with a partner or whether it's, and, or also, um, you know, a truth seeking mission or whatever it might be, but it's this inner direction you don't need to be told what to do. Like as a female, I don't want to tell my man what, you know, I don't want to tell a guy what to do. Don't ask me what to do. It's a, it pushes my buttons. I'm like, you know, be inner directed, right? Have inner direction, be proactive. That is a masculine quality, right? That I, that I find to be really attractive. And let me see what else I wanted to say. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about this is a reality and it's not politically like popular, but this biologically we're different, okay? And for the most part, women have children, bear children, and men don't bear children. And this is a biological reality that has impact on our relationships and our in our um. And I think for women, especially mothers, there's a certain vulnerability that happens and it's real. Now, I thought when I was young that I could do it all and be it all. And I, I was going to have a career and I was going to have kids and I was going to have it all. And now that I'm, you know, years down the line, and I've been a single mother since 2009, raising, you know, three kids, I realized, no, wait a minute you know, I've been re I was really missing having a real man in my life. And my life was much, much harder for them, for that lack. And that my ability to fully be a, myself as a woman, is really uh, restricted by not having, you know, a strong masculine partner, even if we weren't, you know, together. But to, even if my my former partner, former husband had stepped up into his role and his commitment in a way, in a different way, it would have felt so much better for my children and for myself. So you, even if partners split, the role of the man is so important. And I just wanna you know, share that, I think I'll end there. Mm. Leslie, thank you so much for sharing all that. And I, I feel you differently. I don't have your particular story exactly, but I can relate with what's lacking in a woman's life when she doesn't have that strong masculine to back her up. Uh, I've been single for a very long time, going on eight years, and it was necessary for me to do a significant amount of inner work. But it comes to a point where when the woman is alone, she has to really duel these roles between masculine and feminine within herself. And it can become a little bit exhausting. And it'd be nice just to, to settle a little more into my feminine more often to have that support of the masculine. But um, as we all know, it's, it's not that easy nowadays to find the right partner. And this is something I wanna bring up that really weighed heavy on my heart, Leslie, as you were talking. First, I wanna say that your qualities about what a man is and your, your relation to that with your father was so beautiful. And I wanna be really honest and vulnerable and say how envious I am that you had that mm. because I didn't have that. I think we've come to a similar place though, which is so interesting, isn't mm. it? That we can come, we can still kind of cross paths, intersect 
quite fluidly, even though I had a very passive father who wasn't really present for me. And you seem to have these qualities of, of a strong, healthy father. But my what weighs heavy on my heart insofar as a collective energy right now and, and some of the ways in which the world is in all of these schisms and divisions is that I, I have such radical love in my heart for couples who decide that they're not equally yoked together and they need to do a separation and the effects of the court system on a man especially if the woman is going to weaponize the children or finances or really try to take the man of all of his assets and, and really weaponize that i ha i ha i think this is why i think it's 70 percent of divorces are initiated by women I think that a lot of the repercussions of the court system here in America have to do with that. And I also think, and I need your help, I need all of your help on this one, is that the, the, mm, the upholding of the sovereignty, the presence, the commitment to show up, the ability to hold the difficult emotions and to be there drastically conflicts with if somebody's not an equal partner for somebody. I think that men can have this guilt or shame because we're telling them that a good man shows up, he doesn't abandon his children, he's present, he's noble, he's honorable. So then when a man, because we've come into, many of us have come into relationship backwards forward, right? So we, we come into these partnerships that aren't necessarily sacred partnerships. So then if, the man may be real well like now i'm afraid to actually leave unless she initiates it because i'm guilty because i'm not being noble i'm not being present i'm not showing up for my kids i'm not so to me i feel this extra weight on the man if they're not in a healthy partnership to take those steps and if you guys have any feedback on that if i'm wrong please tell me but i just feel like it might be even extra harder to hold those qualities onto a man if he hasn't already, if he's not in a sacred partnership or in a really healthy relationship, that that may make him feel more stuck. Does this make any sense to you guys? Yeah, I mean, real quick. I mean, I was married for nine years, had a really super loving relationship, uh, traveled across the seas, lived in France for this woman and this and that. And uh, she ended the relationship and I was so like heart shatteredly broken. But uh even you know understanding that our paths you know separated i never i was never the one to like end any kind of relationship i was always the one you know on the end of getting you know i wouldn't say dumped but you know like you know the woman breaking the news to me like hey it's over kind of thing you know and uh yeah i kind of, uh, had to reflect on that through my shadow work and like you know was i assertive enough like you know did i not hold you know enough boundaries type of thing so yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting dynamic you mentioned, and I've never heard it articulated like that before, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Yeah. It, it feels to me like most men are the stayers, mm -hmm. that they're going to stay and they're going to be devoted, but yet even if it's not necessarily healthy, and if they come to that, like you said, maybe they're not seeing that. Maybe they are really trying to uphold those qualities, Leslie, that you said, that maybe we don't really see that we're we're missing something that's not equally aligned. I mean, I hope that we can start to fix these schisms and heal within ourselves to match up with the right people because I do know a lot of people, guys, who, you know, they have families, they have their their worlds, their careers, this and that. The couple really isn't happy. He feels trapped. He doesn't want to leave his kids, but he's not happy. And it's like all of this tension because of these qualities that we try to say, well, well this is what you need to uphold. But the, the most important thing is that, do you, how is it when you, do you uphold them if you're not in a sacred partner, partnership and it's toxic? Or do you have to face yourself and break those noble qualities for a moment to like realign with somebody that you're actually healthy with? You know, I think that it's, that it, one, you can a man can embody those qualities but also be flexible enough to separate when it's time you know if a woman is is breaking up a relationship and especially if there's children involved you know there's um and there is a tribe i have this book i wanted to look it up and i couldn't find it 
but it was based on a, an indigenous tribe in South America. And it was one of the tribes that was um, held on to its traditional ways for a really long time because it was so far out into the jungle and so forth. And, and the weird part about it is they were like, um, they were headhunters. They had the home, the men had this whole thing where they would, they would uh, voluntarily, they would, you know, be very fierce. And there would be times that they would capture other men from other tribes and they would, they would shrink their heads and all this. That's kind of the gruesome part of it. But the, the, the thing with the, with the men and the women was that the, when, when a, couple partnered and they were in um, a relationship, there was a certain recognition that that in the roles of that particular society, right, the way that they, they worked, they made it work for everyone, everyone to be taken care of, that the commitment of a man to the woman and his children was, was lifelong. And yet a woman could leave. They, they didn't force a woman to stay. And if the woman chose to leave, and especially if there was violence, they, this community wanted her to be safe and to leave. But the expectation was that that man would fall, would always make sure that the woman and child had had a place to live, or that they had food that they were taken care of. And that if they didn't, that that, that commitment was always there. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be beautiful. And oh. you know, how men, how wonderful would it be for women to, to have that security, you know, not to take advantage of it, which unfortunately in our society can happen, um, but to honor it and to know that um, we take care of each other. Mm. Our word, the word is honorable, right? Mm. Yeah, Leslie, I think that, you know, I know a lot of people from the One Great Network are really discussing conscious parenting and, and an element of this is also conscious separation, if that needs to happen. And there's a fallacy that we've had from the past that it's better to stay together for the children. I can say from experience is that I believe that children are very intuitive as so far as the actual health of the, the mother and father's relationship. And although I know we're conditioned that staying together is better, if the relationship truly isn't healthy, I would hope that we can move into a society where we can just be radically honest. And with the kids, if they're at a particular age to say, we didn't know, we're trying to do better, we're gonna do this, like this conscious separation with, with a focus on loving the children. I do know many men, I don't know how many of you gentlemen here have kids, but I do know several men who are near and dear to my heart, who've been through separations, who weren't as conscious and the mother took the kids from them. And men seem to be deeply heartbroken and affected when their children are taken from them. So I think that this all just brings up this concept of if we're working towards what it means to be conscious men and women or healthy men and women, we first have to realize that there's a lot that we didn't know about ourselves, about relationships, about culture, about society, and that we're now in this moment making a conscious decision, no matter where we come from, what our age is, to do better. Not be perfect, but be reasonably better. And in that, we may have to bring up some difficult things, but if we can do it in the containment, the, having those first principles of the love is there, it's just going to look a little different. There is suffering that goes along when a couple splits with the children. But again, it, we live in complex times. We live in times where we're either going to stick with what, what we did, which doesn't work. We all know that. Or we're going to have to have some growing pains to be stronger and say, you know what? We, we, we didn't know. We, we, we did something. We weren't aware. Now we're becoming aware. So that's why I think it's calling us all in this difficult position that we're these pattern breakers of the old toxic way, the old unhealthy way, which means that we're going to do things in our experiences that's going to hurt and harm people. So what does a, you know, being a man, what does a man look like for me now? One who's choosing to change to become more authentic and healthy. And in that change, it might not look real pretty. It might not look like you have your shit totally together. And I'm okay with that. What I'm looking for in a, a, from a woman's point of view right now is not a man to embody all those beautiful qualities that Leslie's dad embodied. 
if you can get there or if those men exist, I know they do, God bless their, their hearts. But for the men who are deciding to evolve, all I'm looking for from my perspective as a woman is that you're honest with me and that you're committing to evolve. That's all I'm looking for right now. Honesty and communication, you know, um, a willingness to grow, right? Yeah. To do the work. Yeah, and I think um, Brandon, yeah. you mentioned this in, in the, the talk we had of just, you know, stand true to your word and, and this and that and having that honor and stuff. And uh, Jim and Jerry, I can't see y'all, but uh, y'all want to chime in on, on some things? Because uh, Jim, uh, you're a parent, right? You have kids? You've been, you've been married before? You've been divorced, I, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, kind of these days a single dad. Um, they're with me most of the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm just grateful. I've been quiet and, and absorbing a lot of this and I really appreciate your point of view. And uh, I'm finding it like, you know, it's a very complicated subject, obviously. And of course, like, I don't think any of us men could hit the mark, like hit every mark, you know, of, you know what I mean, of what it is to be the perfect man. Like we may be good in some areas and and bad in others, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I'm you know, I'm just grateful to be able. I'm here to learn, yeah. you know. I want to be the get the best father, the best man. Um. But yeah, I'm just uh, I, I like what you said, um, Stephanie, at the the very last thing about. I feel like I'm I'm on that path of you know of, of fulfilling my purpose, and it's very messy and sloppy, and, mm -hmm. and it doesn't. I don't. I feel like I don't look like I'm like the best man or the best provider and stuff like that, you know, but um yeah i mean i'm just happy to, to hear your, what you guys have to say um yeah i'll pass I, it i'll have something more to say later i'm sure i i do want to say you know that i feel that the the greatest thing is is the test agree with stephanie the authenticity and the the willingness to grow and learn and be willing to self-reflect you know, and evolve. That's so vital. You know, I feel like to what, um, you know, I appreciate in a man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's this time in history, guys, we're all here for a reason. All of us are here. You know, we watch Mark, we're trying to, we're all evolving, we're all changing, we're all growing. I don't think any of us in this network claim to be perfect or claim to be the perfect man or woman. So it's, um, we're all meeting each other on very level playing field. And, um, you know, if we do this as far as asking the women the same questions, I'd be, I'd say the same thing, Jim, that you said, mm -hmm. is that show me, help me as a woman to be better because I'm radically imperfect and I'm trying and this is what I'm discovering, but I'm really open and curious to learn and get better. And, you know, I just want all of you guys to know that you're deeply loved, even though we've fucked up we've we've made changes we've had divorces we've done things and you know you you are deeply deeply loved and needed exactly as you are because that's exactly where i am mm -hmm. and i'm hoping that somebody would hold that grace with me i'm yeah. divorced i blew up my life i did things that, that were in, you know i did that stuff too and I, you know we're not perfect but those people who look perfect they might just be the ones that are just living that reputation but behind closed doors it's a lot of bullshit yeah. i'm sure not yeah. everybody's like that but yeah stephanie what what you were talking about before just like really hit home for me i, I mean my story i'm not going to tell the whole story but um 2020 i left a marriage of 17 years and i remember standing in front of my two teenage daughters at that time mm -hmm. 13 and 16 and telling them that i was going to leave Oh. and they were like we kind of knew this was coming dad mm -hmm. and I was like how the hell did you know I didn't I never <laughs> planned on this I, I, it was the furthest thing from my mind I, I was going to stay in my marriage no matter what that was exactly what you were describing to me it was like a ego sense of honor type thing mm -hmm. that 
I'm never going to run out. And that's kind of what I was accused of, probably still am to some extent, um, but maybe not. Um, my ex is actually a beautiful person and we have a good um, friendship in some ways. Um, but the point is that for me, now looking back, I've had a couple of years. It was hard. It was depressing. I was like you waking up in this friend's house in some room, like, what the hell did I do to my life? But um, I really see the other side of that now that I had to do that. Mm. And it was that same Confucius thing you're describing. And um, I still have a great relationship with my daughters and um, I see them and we talk and you know what I mean? It's not like it didn't end things. It just, it was a new beginning. So um, yeah, um, Jerry, anything popping off with you? You've been really quiet, buddy. <laughs> yeah, man, um, just seeing you guys shine and smile that makes me very happy so i don't have to say anything but just i'm grateful to be here this is awesome i'm gonna re i'm gonna listen to this again just soaking it in good, good. yeah yeah well thanks yeah. thanks for being here and hey like leslie said part of being a man it's just being there and holding that space and being yeah being part of the emotional uh current and not letting it uh push you away being able to stand there and be part of it thanks jerry mm. You know, your smile comment, Jerry, is women desire to be beauty in the world. We desire to show up innocently with love and smiling and have fun and be playful and be the free spirit. This is what this is our true nature. This is really what we want. It's just like you guys, though, the world hasn't created a real safe container for us to be that way. And if, if it is beauty, it's hijacked, manipulative, stripping, porn. Like, this isn't what the true, innocent, sacred feminine is about. She's not about that stuff. It's more innocent. It's more pure. But we do desire to be beauty for you and show up in that. It's just we, we're trying to all cultivate that environment um, to be, return, at least I am, to kind of return back to that free spirit and pr woman of the community and you know, not so much about me or selfish or selfies or like, I, I don't like any of that shit. Maybe because I'm older, you know, I'm in my mid forties guys. So it's like, you know, I'm, I'm not in that generation, but I really want to go like have a return to innocence. I want to know, I want to heal. And then I want to return to the metaphorical garden. I want to go back to, to peace and love and beauty. That's really what I want as a woman. I'm and so many uphold. men want that women, you know, across the globe to do that as well. And uh, I'm going to share a story just because, and Brandon, I, I know you're in, it shouldn't get a little something in there, but uh, real quick, uh, I lived in the south of France for six years and I worked on a private beach and in the south of France, you know, like women, you know, sunbathe topless and all that stuff. And uh, me easily acclimated to that because I was so committed to my wife and this and that, but, you know, as a man and this and that, and like being a, a server on a private beach and, you know, trying to protect the space or whatever. And also, you know, like I'm like serving food to like hundreds of people a day, you know, and like uh, what I did is, uh, you know, I, I recognized a very liberating expression of that feminine essence of wanting to that, you know, be beautiful and just, you know, like let it all out and do whatever. And then I was like, wow, I, I fucking love that. And this and that, not like gawking around, like what, because I, I was married and that, that was, you know, some the reins that held me back, you know, first and foremost, but at the same time, just like respecting every single individual, just on that individual basis and respecting their boundaries and all that stuff on a frequency level as well, not just, you know, like whatever. And, and I even got to the point where I'm I'm in the sun, you know, all day long. I wasn't even wearing sunglasses after the first year. You know, I did this for six years. So I could have that eye contact and show that respect through my eyes, the windows to the soul, to them. That I'm not fucking, you know, hiding behind sunglasses and looking you up and down or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, fuck all that. And let them have that sacred space to be themselves and all that stuff. And, and a whole hold the fort down for you know other motherfuckers that might fuck around you know like because i'm a bartender as well was a bartender and all that stuff so you have to have you know be protective of that whole space and people acting out because of you know induced you know alcohol behavior all that shit. 
but yeah, that's all I wanted to say about that. Um, Brandon was good, man. <laughs> and <laughs> was our good. time in Vegas. We went to so many, you know, we hit the strip of Vegas. Yeah. We didn't go to any strip clubs, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that t-shirt you got, by the way, man. Representing my yachts, man. Like, oh, yeah. Yep. Sacred to that yep. shit, yo. <laughs> yeah, hell my yacht. Yeah, it's yeah, funny buddy. because a lot of the things that we talked about in that video, Hell in Vegas, correlate to a lot of what we're talking about now. And Leslie brought up some amazing points. Um, integrity, you know, hell honest, um, uh, you know, having principles. And one thing is consistency. You know, being in consistency, you know, you honoring, you know, your word, you being supportive, you saying something and you backing it up, you know, so you build that consistency by way of showing what action as to with your hands, you know, actually building and constructing a good communication as far as in any relationship. That's something that I think a good man should bring to the table is being hell consistent. Something that I've talked about, you know, many times before is with these hands have power. So what are you actually creating? So you build that consistency by means of report with communication. It doesn't matter if it's with a friend's family, you know, work spouse, but you being there on a consistent basis, you having that integrity, you honoring your word that right there is to truly is what should be honored as far as being a, a man yes i agree you fucking manhandled that shit yo <laughs> <laughs> I, feel like it. It, I feel like there's this kind of feedback loop where as women and men is that a lot of these qualities we're talking about with men are external qualities but there has to be like with women, it's like, it's coming, you have to take care of yourself. You have to still know thyself. You have to do the work to be able to express authentically and bring it back in, clean yourself out and express authentically. Like it feels yep. like we can't forget that women, the nature of feminine energy is a lot of internalization, processing work, pulling in, developing that. But it is this dual nature of inner and outer and that they both need to be dancing and working together and constantly being addressed and cleansed out. Right. So like, you don't want to just be giving out, giving out, giving out, giving out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I am recover, recovering people pleaser. I don't know if any of you guys have had <laughs> that tendency, but um, you know, so I had to kind of find my balance is what I'm trying to say. Make sure that I'm giving to me. So I'm putting out authentically and I'm not expressing unmet needs and saying oh i'm being altruistic and giving but really i'm doing things out in the world to manipulate energy because i have unmet needs do you know what i mean yeah. i think you know mm. as a woman i need to make sure that i have my inner protector you know i cannot just abdicate that role of protecting myself you know to let a man do it all the time right i have to have the balance of the feminine and the masculine within me and then men also needing to allow that softer side and the emotional intelligence, you know, um, emotional attunement. Those are the qualities that I think have been like conditioned out, you know, out of men or boys told that you shouldn't cry, you shouldn't, emotions are for sissies, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's bringing back, you know, the balance more so within, I agree. May that I hurt my fifis. No. <laughs> <laughs> May I ask you guys a question? What is your relationship as a woman? I do love what what Leslie just said about being, you know, being vulnerable, being being honest. You're told not to cry, but do do you feel like you know, like what is your relationship with crying? Is what I really want to ask you. Like, do you feel like you've been suppressed of crying, or do you feel oh, like absolutely you, actually, like, you do? Uh -huh. Yes, yes. Um, and this is just my own personal experience because I was in the sports a lot, you know, um, uh, play you know, a lot of sports. So I never really showed much of emotions hell, growing up. Even as a child, I rarely ever cried. Even now, sometimes I have a hard time crying. It's like my eyes will get watery, but the tears just won't come out. Like I literally have to like force myself. So that's still something that I am working on. But as I've, you know, started to go within myself and, you know, heal my own trauma and stuff like that, 
now I look at crying as a form of release, you know, like you have some kind of pent up uh, hell emotion or some form of pressure that you need to just kind of let go of. So now I look at it a little bit more differently. It's still a struggle, something I'm still working on, you know, because it does take time to kind of, you know, to kind of heal yourself. But now I see crying is totally different. Um, and I'm kind of just waiting for that time, you know, when those tears just start flowing and, you know, cause I know it's going to come a hell eventually, but yeah, it's still, a, it's still a tough thing for me now. Like my eyes will get watery, but it's still something there, you know, but it is a form of release now, but yeah, it was definitely something within myself that got held repressed, uh, and held emotions that I suppressed too for many years, you know, something I'm still working on. And I'll just say for me, as like having been the single mom and very kind of um, driven and um, responsible all the time, like I, 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 in some ways have created um, a wall from my own emotionality or te the tears coming, you know, mm -hmm. because sometimes when there's in that imbalance, you know, then you just are surviving, right? And then you lose touch with that feminine flow of water, right? So I think it's, it's yeah. yeah, Leslie, I have to say, I, I know I mentioned to you guys that I've been working in this healthcare sector for a while, which is extremely left brain and extremely masculine. And prior to that, I owned a yoga and wellness center. So I was able to be in my feminine a lot past couple of years. It, it just hit me this weekend because I did a retreat, um, a kind of a yoga and meditation retreat for the first time in three years. And before I went, I was doubled over crying. And I was like, this is the first time I cried in like years. Mm -hmm. And I realized I was not letting myself truly feel the depths of my heart space because I was so cognitive in my left brain trying to do what I needed to do in that survival mode within my career and the singleness, all of that stuff. And as I was crying, I, I kind of became the witness for a second. And I was like, if I can think and shut down my crying, and be like, oh, just focus on something else, or you got to get dressed. I can think something and shut down my crying. But I just, I realized that in order to cry, you have to fully permit the opening of your heart. But you can easily talk yourself out of it and stop mm -hmm. your crying. And what I did was I, I wanted to stop it. But I said, no, 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 no. What is it? Let yourself, let it come up. What are you feeling? Oh, you haven't done this for a long time. Oh, you're, you're not really happy in this cerebral. Like, let those feelings flow. And when I let them flow, I found myself really, really doubled over weeping and really realizing that I could only weep when I permit my heart to be open. Boom. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. yep. And that was my a hard explosive type of you know it, it was beyond a kundalini type of awakening what i what i had and it was like profuse uh, uh weeping like the most profound i've ever had in my life and it was it felt like the universe zapped me and all this stuff and um for the past three years <clears throat> i probably cried more days than not mm. and for me you know crying you know letting letting the emotions flow you know, like hardcore fucking, you know, like the river reservoir type of shit. It's been very therapeutic, cathartic healing and just, you know, going through the fucking process of all types of shit going on in one's life. It just is what it is. Motherfuckers want to, you know, say some like, you know, taboo bullshit, you know, programmed traditional, you know, archaic type of way of, you know, base level consciousness. You know, that's not where the true heart based intelligence is at. You know, everyone's been fucked up and fucked over in whatever ways in this life. And if you're not letting it out and you keep that shit bottled up, guess what? It's going to come back in self inflicted suffering, manifested ways of, you know, health issues or whatever the fuck so for me brandon spencer and i had been living light as a feather throughout so many fucking you know, stormy weathers and throughout you know heart felt heartbreaking endeavors and uh you know it is what it is and as a man trying to you know balance that sacred feminine and not let the waters of emotion and flood us all the time mastering and being the captain of our ship on that boat, being able to stay afloat, 
and all that shit and not emote too much and be loose the fuck out on some, you know, negative feedback loop type of shit. Mm. Yeah, that's where it's at. That is where the fucking, you know, real heart-based awakened man resides. Yeah. Mm. It takes courage yeah. to mm. let go yeah. in that way, yeah. I think. And to find the space to allow emotion to just be, because it's, um, it is also like a vulnerable place to be. And I think that for both men and women, this rat race that we're in, this uh, constant pressure to make, you know, make the bread and put up food on the table, um, it shuts down a uh, part of us that can relax and be in that space of presence within ourselves to feel those feelings and give them time to emote, right? And we all deserve that. We all need that time. Mm. Yeah. You know, Leslie, when uh, Derek, you were telling your story and Leslie, to, to add on to what you're saying is, I think it feels to me like when you cry, you release. We all said that you do, you feel a huge release. And when we don't permit ourselves to open our heart and cry, when we're overthinking, well, what are we doing? We're actually suppressing. We're stuffing in true feelings. And then I think what happens is we start to, these suppressions create layers. And it's like the more layers that we create to our true self, the less vision we have and less clarity we have moving forward in our life because there's all of this garbage the more and energetic work suppression. Yeah, yeah. It's like you have to just peel and peel and peel. So a good, healthy cry, I think, is is releasing not just fluid but releasing um energy so we have more internal inner space to see clearly and reroute ourselves yeah i love that yeah yeah i feel really um proud of my ability to cry i can remember you know as we're talking i'm remembering times when i've cried in the last couple of years i'm i'm proud of myself for it i, I you know the other it's like um, being on construction job sites. I remember one particular guy I used to work with, he called himself a hair farmer. He had real long hair. He was always joking all the time. Most of his jokes were like sexual innuendos, you know, but he loved to make fun of the guys that were afraid of their, um, what would you call it? being afraid of your sexuality? Like, so he would pretend to be gay, you know, like, cause that was not cool on the job cool. sites we were on. Right. Mm -hmm. And so he and I would play with that and, you know, joke around how fine each other's ass were and such, because, you know, we're very comfortable, mm. you know, and I've always appreciated about that, about myself too. I don't really mind being close to another man. Um, just the other day, our, our friend who teaches dance, he was leading me and I was being the woman and I was dancing with him. I was fine with that. Um, God. And so like being comfortable with being a male for me is not being so afraid of somebody thinking I'm not. So go ahead and think I'm not. We'll see what happens when the shit hits the fan. You know, I'm pretty confident in my own faith to be manly when I need to be. And um, I'll be the first one to cry when I'm sad as hell. And, and I've been shaking, crying and tears pouring on the floor and seeing the little drops on the ground, you know, and, and I'm proud of that, you know. It's like breaking down the barriers all these yeah. barriers and limitations. Like Derek, when you were talking about, I was imagining being a man in France on the beach, serving beautiful topless women, like that, that's a young man's, any man's dream, right? But, but you're, you're saying I'm seeing this freeness as beauty. And if, and if I try to micromanage it or use it, if I try to use this beauty for my own advantage, then I'm creating compartments. It's not free to just be it's like this externalized beauty like that's what we want that freedom to break down the barriers to let the beauty be hey my eyes are up here you know <laughs> <laughs> sorry yeah i get it hey yeah. guys we got um i get stuff yeah for sure like <laughs> about um our if we finish up at two hours we got about 10 minutes which i think would be great um to kind of finish up this whole thought process here is to like um each go around and just talk about a couple takeaways that we something we took away from this discussion and we could give to anyone that might be listening um i'll go ahead and start and then i'll pass it to you stephanie and then just pass to the person next to you Great. um i think a couple of takeaways for me were um honor being honorable and showing up and and being consistent i think those are two of the real real key things that 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 i um that I, I take away. So um, mm. how about you, Stephanie? 
I think from a feminine perspective of what I'm taking away from this is that I feel a lot of hope. I feel excited to step back into my free space and to know that the men that I've always needed in my life are here. So thank you guys. Mm -hmm. oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Brandon? Sure. Um, one of the things that I'm going to take away from this, from what Jim said and what Stephanie said, is it can get messy. You know, how nobody is perfect. Um, and how that's the thing is somebody from the outside is not going to see when things get messy and the reason why, because you are trying to you know, get your shit together. You are trying to straighten up, you know, how your room, you're trying to clean up how your own mess. You are trying to fix your own trauma. So I think that's what we can understand it, is even though things may not appear as though we have our shit together from like a societal you know, standpoint, we're trying to get our shit together from an internal spiritual soul how aspect. And that's really how what matters. I'm going to pass it on to Rick. Well, what I would take away is a lot of what you guys just said, too, is consistency, for one, and that it's not an easy topic um, or an easy answer. And I think that a lot of people have to do the work on themselves. I think that's so important that, that that's something that's lacking is that people aren't taking the time to even get to know themselves. They don't who they don't know who they are anymore. <laughs> and for many reasons the society steering them and telling them who they are and i just think that what i'm taking away is that it's so important to get to know yourself to, to love yourself and to do the work on yourself and for me it, it, a tough thing has always been to kind of show emotions at times and i think that comes from dealing with my disability for so many years i think that at times that wall comes up and i become kind of cold and i've noticed that mm. is that i kind of get this coldness about me and I, I've talked to my wife about it I talked to friends about it because I do feel at times that I put this wall up so it's very important to, to show and feel your emotions is, mm -hmm. is what I'm taking mm -hmm. away and I will pass it to you Jim um yeah well I got a, a few things from this for sure um I liked um I learned about myself like maybe why the, uh, the way I'm acting the way I would act in a relationship or towards a woman. And obviously it's a lot of it's based on fear. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and uh, just, uh, I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. I, I'd love to continue this conversation and just, you know, there's, there's so much more to, to talk about, but um, just to really appreciate it all. So thank mm -hmm. you. And uh, pass it to Derek. Moi, ooh la la. I didn't even get to mention, you know, like, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Leslie uh, and Stephanie, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate your perspectives and, you know, you know, willingness to be vulnerable and share, you know, certain experiences and, and some of the relationships or, you know, fatherhood, you know, that you've gone through and all that. And, uh, and yeah, what I took away from this, and it's been on my mind for a while, and uh, just like uh, this Facebook group, uh, the Shadow War community is, is awesome. You know, this where mm -hmm. they talk about a lot of this Jungian mm -hmm. psychology, which I mentioned earlier. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I forget. I think it, it was Stephanie, I think you mentioned of the whole aspect of, you know, men uh, wanting to, or that little need to be in I think it falls into this law of Gebel or reciprocity. <laughs> Dude, I, I want to say something in French, like, so it, it doesn't work. Anyways, but, um, so it's like, you know, like women want to feel admired in this and that men do as well sometimes. And, and through different ways as well, it, it could be through their actions, their craft, you know, doing whatever even even if it's fucking playing sports or you know building a house or you know that kind of stuff or having some of the dirtiest the filthiest you know dangerous jobs known to fucking humankind sometimes you know you don't see a lot of women in those positions yeah. and um those are some of those unseen actions that men do that are not necessarily you know praised or honored, honored enough in society honored. so uh yeah, I understand, like, that does lead to a lot of fucking, like, 
depression mm -hmm. and like these, you know, you know, inferiority complexes almost, you know, like, you know, they're at the the fucking ass crack of the end of society almost, you know, you're 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 a fucking plumber or you know, you're you know, working a septic tank, some something like that, or you're working in a fucking mm -hmm. coal mine or some shit like that. No one wants that job. Mm. I mean, but people fucking do that. And you know, going back to, you know, real quick, you know, what we talked about with Chris in the dissolving the divide of, you know, money being the motivator of so many fucking things and how it's been such a toxic twist on people's behaviors and this and that. And that is part of the perversion, inversion, and conquer and divides strategies and, and tactics that are used against us in this fucking rat race, matrix, uh, bullshit, shit mm -hmm. stem <laughs> that's got, you know, people pitted against people, sexes against sex, you know, all this stuff. And um, you know, it's just great to, you know, break common ground with, uh, with men and women together on a panel like this. And the energy that Stephanie and Leslie provided is quite divine. And yeah, I really appreciate it. And, and I'm grateful for your time. So not to drag on. Jerry, what's cracking, man? <laughs> on the East what's Coast. Up, guys? I'm trying late. to... Yeah, so what I got out of this was that I uh, really appreciate being, you know, I know we're online, but just interacting with females, like, mm -hmm. even, like, in person, that would be nice, you know? It's like, what's the problem? Like, what's the fear? Fear is illusion. I mean, do the shadow work, like, all right, you know, start removing unnecessary stuff, baggage that's not helping me move, me move forward. And to, like surrounding myself with conscious beings like you guys you guys are making my life a lot better more positive and uh yeah i just wanted to say that i'll pass it to you leslie thank you oh, i've got a lot of thoughts and feelings kind of um bubbling around and and one of them is just this wave of love really and compassion um you know uh for us all mm -hmm. and and also I really love the company of men. I love men. I always have felt this real warmth in my heart and um, a, a compassion and appreciation of being in the, you know, around men and the energy of men. And I think that it's what I've see, saw it a lot is that it's really nice, especially in this, this kind of uh, recent interactions, to be able to have that company and, and not all be sexualized right and to have male friends and to have like work together and to have this kind of conversation and to get to know each other as human beings you know from our hearts and that's really healing um and i've also realized that you know we talk about the this the patriarchy right and this toxic toxic male, right? But what I've, I've realized is that the men have gotten um, wounded in, in this as well, and maybe more so. Um, I think that women have had this rebound of anger, and I can, you know, be very in touch, even, even now in some ways that I think about things, that I, I held a lot of anger towards the men in my life, and disappointment, and um, frustration, and um, and uh, that that has come really from the the desire to to have this healthy male female dynamic mm -hmm. you know, in life and and not having had it and and so there's really I think women a lot you know our job really is to step back a bit and allow men to step into figuring out how to be their own man, you know, um, and not be so critical and so scathingly, you know, like bitter um, or take over, you know, the world, you know, that what men are trying to step into doing their best to be, to be a man and, and be masculine. And then women are just sometimes like bolt roll right over, you know, and I, I think that part of what my friend Nancy was saying is about honoring men. I think that's a real call out to women to start honoring the the challenges that men have gone through, you know, just to be a male in this world. 
and uh, give them a little slack here and, and, and step forward with our hearts as well as we all figure it out, you know, together. Hell yeah. And real quick, just because, you know, like we can honor men and this and that, but there's a lot of men that are not acting fucking honorable and don't really deserve that honor. You know, it's like very true. Yeah. you were talking about real quick. And I want to touch on this real quick because, you know, women, yes, you guys go through a lot of, you know, physical changes that men never fucking experience with the birthing process and this and that and the hormonal changes that comes with it and that inner yoni, that inner heart that extra you know reproductive organ that can completely change your physicality if you give birth for example and men it's like oh what a burden you know they might have to fucking you know, throw down an extra six pack to you know gain a fucking you know beer belly or some shit like that because they can't handle the their emotion because they don't have the emotional intelligence to fucking process that shit and fucking alchemize that shit whatever the fuck so for for you two women, real quick, just to get you on, if there's any kind of words of encouragement, solution-oriented type of stuff to, you know, get some of these guys in line. And it ain't to fucking, you know, throw shade or splash haterade on them, whatever the fuck. But it's like, you know, like, there's a lot of guys in this world that need to step their motherfucking game up. Let's be honest. You know, yeah. like, we're talking about the divine masculine a lot of times of all, the, all this praising and honoring that shit. But, you know, as far as, like, resurrecting the dead, masculine, toxic, fucking bullshit slop that's out there. So you know? I wanted to add this, that, um, so there's a a, a man that I, I he's um, a medicine man, a shaman South, from South America, and he was talking about that there's a real lack of rite of passage, mm -hmm, especially mm -hmm. for boys mm -hmm. to become men, and that he, he said this is one of the biggest failings in our society mm -hmm. is not having oh. this right of passage and this role model yeah. and mentorship of, from men to boy and mm -hmm. that what's happened is this turnaround in our society where a lot of men have either become abusers or suckers meaning they're sucking the woman's titty mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that you know the men become sort of like big children Mm -hmm. And a lot mm -hmm. of women, you know, if you talk to them, they'll say, I'm, I'm really, I don't need another, like a fifth kid in my house, I, yeah. I, or, mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so there's like this, this lostness. And so, yes, there's a lot of, of, of lost men and it's being expressed in narcissism and abusiveness and mm -hmm. you know, tantrums and, and dependency on women and, you know. And that is sort of where we are at in our society. And a lot of that has to do with bowing down to authority yep. and giving up your sovereign right to be a man, whether you're a man or a woman, and mm -hmm. recognizing that you have to take responsibility for your own life. Mm -hmm. And we got droves of people living dead who are very happy to give up their rights and um, trust their big daddy state to handle so many of these things. And that's why they've been indoctrinated to be so um, submissive or fakely aggressive. Mm -hmm. And yep. what's the last thing I'm really noticing when I'm thinking about it is all the most powerful male aspects that we really talked about in this episode um, are almost like the opposite of what you learn on TV and comic books. <laughs> We're talking about being sensitive and listening and showing up and making mm -hmm. soft decisions that are over time, little things are the big things, the little decisions, men showing up consistently. Those aren't, those aren't the big heavy duty ax throwing actions. Those are the calm, steady showing up and listening and being able to shed a tear and stoic out of it, you know, yeah, right. Exactly. And those are like the opposite of what we're taught and what we think is maleness and we're coming mm -hmm. out with. When, and, um, go ahead, Leslie. When uh, Maria West was on a, a guest on Dissolving the Divide, she made the point of saying that nurturing is actually a masculine quality. And mm -hmm. I was thinking about that and I was remembering the times, you know, in my life where I felt the most, um, I guess, relaxed and uh, the ability to be me and uh, to be feminine, to sit in my feminine state is when a man is being very nurturing to me, right? Very present. 
in loving, nurturing ways, right? It's kind of like, you know, you think of the mother who's always giving, giving, giving to her children, right? And when does she get to relax? Mm -hmm. you know, it's hopefully in that dynamic of, of a man, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. providing that space. Mm -hmm. in a sense. Um, so and that I, I think as we heal, as we continue on this process of healing, that these sorts of actions we're talking about and qualities will come natural and organic, just like a mother would be able to take care of her child. They're going to become more organic with men and women, but I think we're just in this process of figuring out where we missed the mark, leaving the conditioning, and being able to start to conceptualize and embrace where we're going. But I'm hoping we can get to a place, like with a mother and child, that these relationship dynamics become more second nature, where we don't have to necessarily process it so much. And talking about it, like in this forum, I think is yeah. really important. I was going to say that too. Communication is key. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, what we've talked about um, going forward is continuing this discussion. And um, the next step would be looking at the um, what is a woman and mm -hmm. what does it mean to be a woman? So um, if anyone who's watched this show and made it all the way here to the um, end and is enjoying this conversation and loving it, um, hit one of us up because we're going to start um, putting together plans to start that next discussion. This is a very important topic that is obviously not talked about enough because the more we discuss it, the more it comes up and the more we realize how much we have to learn. So I, I really appreciate all you um, fine souls sitting here and having this discussion with me. And I'm the luckiest man on earth. I get to hug Leslie when I leave tonight and oh. um, spend time with this beautiful woman. <laughs> and yeah, experience man. what a true woman really is and so yeah. um, you know i couldn't be more lucky and and have that opportunity to try to be the man that i want to be in this relationship so um yeah thanks guys um real Eric, quick real quick real quick real quick can we get our guests to plug their websites or you know like that's what I was where do. I was gonna, okay okay yeah, there we go the <laughs> so go ahead brandon you start um uh, yeah you can catch me on odyssey the one great work network band off of um yeah youtube two channels taken down i'm on there with the greats yeah just catch me on the one great word network not on youtube i'm gonna pass it on to stephanie uh you can find me at stephaniemodavis.com where i do a lot of inner work trauma healing with uh, victims people with chronic illness and people going through transformation and then i also have awakening healthcare which is my ongoing project trying to educate some of the healthcare providers on some of the things we're discussing so thank you guys mm -hmm. i'll hand it off to jim do you have anything to share How truth can we in find your you? heart i just started a youtube page truth in your heart um mm -hmm. we'll share i'll be sharing this video and you know all the stuff we've worked on in the past and i'm gonna i am planning on hitting the streets and going out and interviewing people using that socratic method mm -hmm. and um that's really the the goal. That was the the purpose of creating that page too. So, mm. truth Jim in your heart. Great work on um, permaculture and growing food and that type of thing too. Awesome. That's been my focus over the last ten years. Yep. Um, Jerry. Thanks, Jim. Uh, just like Jim, I. Uh, you know, I have this YouTube channel, Odyssey channel. It's uh, called Heavy Conscious. And you can check me out over there. I'll pass it to Leslie. All right. Well, I have a website called AliveThrive.life. And I am also on the One Great Work Network. I do have a YouTube channel. I think it is alive and thriving or alive thrive oh gosh i should know the name of it but <laughs> right there and on odyssey and um, i'm also um open to uh individuals if they want to do some one-on-one -on -one work um i've worked as a psychotherapist i'm a coach and i really enjoy helping people um you know supporting them on the journey to their own you know inner growth and unfoldment and so how about you, Derek? Oh, dissolving the divide. That's yeah. 
but no, seriously, like, you know, hit Leslie up, you know, she'll give you, you know, 15, 20 minute, you know, free consultation and see what's going on with your mental, spiritual situation. And maybe if you have a little patience, you know, we can come up with some solutions and all that good shit, man. All in good time, man, woman, anyone in between and whatever, you know. So I'm actually in the process of putting out a mix, you know, I put out three mixes already, you know, kind of praising the divine feminine, which is coming up, you know, they have this, you know, what is International Women's Day? And it's like, wow, it's like, I'd rather praise, you know, the divine feminine every single day, especially just having that integration within yourself as well. Like fucking, it's a daily operation, ladies and gentlemen. But uh, yeah, I mix tapestries of truth through music and audio samples, all thrown in together and I do podcasts and other stuff. I'm looking to do a lot of other things with this Dissolving the Divide project that Leslie and I are, are deeply entrenched in at the moment and we're looking to have more people on. And yeah, it's a common theme. It seems like, you know, in almost like any video you see on, you know, BitChute, Odyssey, YouTube, or whatever, like, there's these polarities, there's these divisions, there's these dialectics. And what are we exactly doing about them? Not enough. So Leslie and I are, you know, we're not, we're not carrying any fucking torch. We're not, you know, grandiosoing anything. It's just, you know, like, we're taking a fresh approach on some heart based intelligent ways of bridging these gaps amongst everyone outside of any fucking bullshit ass fucking echo chamber you know that's all i gotta say <laughs> my, YouTube, my youtube channel is my name leslie powers and there's <laughs> i just want to clarify that oh yeah and my i have a youtube channel called awakened in mind so yeah link tree awesome. descriptions chris thank you for hooking that up and letting us plug all that in my friend and uh yeah Wonderful. such a pleasure Wonderful. everyone you know everyone's energy and contributions and all that wait did we oh. miss rick you missed me oh That's shit okay, though <laughs> dude i've been thinking check out yeah, I've been thinking. I've been thinking too much about you and not enough almost at the well, same yeah. time man shit yeah crypt ricks i've been thinking i'm on youtube uh rumble uh part of the one great work network and I'm also on Revolution Radio three nights a week. I'm on Friday nights, Saturday nights, and Monday nights from 6 till 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Busy man. Holy shit. Wonderful. <laughs> and we're trying and to pile on an extra project, you and me. We're, and we are. Yo. We should talk about that. We are. Yeah. We're going to be doing a music project together starting any day now. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. exciting, Derek. You're my priority fucking radar right now. Yeah. yeah. Right on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Complications. But anyways. There's so much shit going on. There's a lot of like videos and wheels within wheels. And, and anyone who's still listening, we just appreciate your time, attention, and energy, focus, and all that stuff. And, and consideration as to you know all these topics and and things that you know touch upon the heartstrings of men and women and children and all that good stuff. So yeah, it's all about the betterment of the individual and rip, rippling that out in the reality field for. The win-win, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Wonderful, beautiful. Yep. Thanks, folks. I'm I'm uh, lucky and happy to rub shoulders virtually here with y'all. And um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's about time to call it a wrap. Great conversation. Andevil.life. Yeah, andevil.life. And I, I really would send people right now to chrisjansen.com and um, enter your email address so you can interact with these wonderful One Great Work Warriors because that's the, where I'm putting out the newsletter of what these guys are working on and what I'm working on with them. And um, I got all kinds of projects going on. I'm going to tell you about on there. So and much also, love, folks. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for yep, peace out. Bye, guys. Bye, See you guys. Bye. See you guys. Recording.